today to all those dads, and not just dads, those who fill that gap. So well, there's lots of dads out there that may not be blood, but they have stepped up and took that role on, and they have rocked it. So we just say Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. So it goes right into my verse this morning. This is in Proverbs 14. It says, Those who fear the Lord are secure. He will be a refuge for their children. And when I read that this morning, I was going over it with Patrick, and it just reminds me of not just God being our father, but um, I was walking around this morning, and donuts with dads is a whole lot different than muffins with mom. Um, the moms make sure, hey, let's go get a muffin. We're going to sit down as a family. We're going to take our selfie, and we're going to be together, and we're going to eat our muffin. This is what we're here to do because this is Mother's Day, and we're going to do it. Dads are just like, I don't know where the kids are. Um, they, they're they here somewhere. They was in a car with me, but I think they ate a donut. Um, I know I ate two, but it was just completely a different experience and as a mom you're like go eat go eat with your with your kids do this we need pictures I got one picture this morning it was of my family it wasn't of anybody else's with their dad so that sort of frustrated me a little bit but then as I read this verse again I'm thinking dads are different and we say it every day men and women are different moms and dads are different and the roles are different and as I was reading this, and I thought of my dad, um, my husband's dad, and my husband himself. Dads are the security of a family. They are the ones who make sure everything's working. They are the ones who make sure that you don't need anything. They have such a huge role, and a donut doesn't serve them justice and a lot of times we feel like dads get shafted on Father's Day because you can always get your mom the pretty stuff jewelry flowers and my girls struggle with this too they're like daddy can only have so many flashlights and screwdrivers so it's it's hard and the reason it's so hard is because dads are our security yes they may not have a lot of material things they may be may not be the most sentimental but the ones that we need whenever we need something took care of, whenever we're trying to get something fixed, or just that safe place. And that's where this comes in, and it's not just your blood dads that do this. That safety, that security that you feel just because your dad is there is awesome. And we find comfort in that with God, and whenever we have a godly father in our lives, and we have that security, and we have that person that we can go to, not just to fix a toy that's broke or to fix a car that's broke. It's it's so much more than that. Whenever we have something that's really, when life, we're learning this now with older kids, when life gets real and it goes past toys and all these things that need to be fixed and there's things that hurt and break our hearts and things that sometimes dads just can't fix, but golly, godly dads know where to point you to. So we're thankful for you guys, and I know you have a funny way of showing it sometimes, and it aggravates us to death, but we love you guys, and we are so thankful for the security that you bring to our homes and our families, and not just our personal families, but to our church. Um, we are very thankful for the men that are of our church that are there that will we can go to whenever we have problems, and you're going to see that here in just a minute on the stage. It may be... An adult with a kid that's not theirs, but it's somebody that just is respected, that that kid cared enough to come and ask you to be with them today. So um, we've got some games because we know dads are competitive and um, like a challenge. So um, we've got some kids and dads that are going to come up on the stage and do some games.
Okay. First, we're going to do who can eat a donut in one bite? I don't either. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. Your fatherly feet. Go on over there. He'll find you, Kayla. <clears throat> okay, first challenge. Who can eat a donut in one bite? Okay, <laughs> Lindsay has disappeared. Hold on just a minute. Don't eat it yet. <laughs> Hold on. I know the smell's killing you. Okay. So, if you want to. Okay. So, are we going to time them or just say go and they go after it? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, you're just going to shove that in and then <laughs> see if you can get it in one and swallow it. We'll come by and. Ready? So parents first. Parents first. Ready? Go. Jason's done with. He's not. Oh. Okay. Tony. I don't think that counted. Okay. Okay, kids. Ready? Do as we say. Do as we say, not as we do. Exactly. Ready? Set. Go. We do have nurses if we need homework. The basket came in handy. Okay, next challenge. Is there another challenge, Lindsay? Okay. The next one is who can eat a donut off a string? You guys shouldn't eat your donuts while ago. This one's time. Do you have your phone? Okay. This one's time. This is a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah. 
We need a string holder. Abony. Monique, you're with, you're going to hold the string. Pass it to Grandpa. We got this. So they have to eat the whole thing? Okay. Off the string. This is going to be hard, y'all. If it falls, do they lose? Is that the... Okay. If it falls off, Tony, you lose. Okay, here we go. Timer's getting ready to start. Ready, set, go. You can't touch the donut. Oh, no. <laughs> it's on the floor. Who do we have left? Avi? I think Abby's practiced this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, 33 seconds. <laughs> she won. I'm sorry. Okay, now time for the adults. Restring your... Redonut your strings, I guess you'd say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, they have been strategizing against each other here. Huh? <laughs> they have hats. Yes, you're supposed to eat it off the string without it falling. I don't know your passcode. Got it. Okay. Are we ready? Jason's on the floor. Okay, I'm sorry. Ready? Set, go. Jason's got a <laughs> Oh, Jason is the winner. 44 seconds. We have waters if you need them. No milk.
Thank you, girls. You won. Okay. Jason, let's make this clear. You got a donut. <laughs> okay. That was fun. So we'll go ahead and pray before we get into worship and the rest of our service. So just bow your heads with me. God, we love you and we thank you for a day that we have to celebrate the dads in our lives, God. We just thank you so much for them. God, we pray that you just be with us today as we uh, come to you and worship you and hear from you, God, and what you have to say to us. God, I pray that you just prepare our hearts <clears throat> and help us, God, to hear what it is that you want us to hear, that we may leave different than when we came in. And we just ask you, God, to be with us this week, be with PJ as he preaches, not only here, God, but all the pastors that are speaking to their congregations today, God. We pray, God, for life change. And we know, God, that it starts in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Uplift. I had to uh, take a few minutes and get some uh, donut off my face. And so it, you know, it's kind of funny that, um, you know, we, we can have fun at church. Um, we can be excited about church. And uh, whenever we were first, first started talking to uh, Amanda, I had these, I almost like daydreams of like picturing a church that you like wanted to go to, and uh, I remember telling the man, I said, "Could you imagine a church where you were like excited, like you you could not wait to go?" And she said, "No, I I can't." And it's like now, like our family, like we we look forward to it, like we. See, we get, we get excited to go, and sure, there's times you're like, man, it's raining outside, and this bed feels so good, and it's like, ah, it'd be nice to kind of sleep in. And then you're like, man, there's times that we, when we can have fun, like we can enjoy church, and we can enjoy our relationship with God. And so, and like Amanda already said, it, it kind of makes it interesting because uh, the way it is with dads, it's like Father's Day and Mother's Day are two completely different, and we're thankful, you know, we're thankful for both because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. And we want to honor you fathers, and so thank you for being who you are and for uh, stepping into those roles. And uh, we have, uh, I say, two drawings that we're going to do for you guys. And so, Lane, if you'll get for me that. Uh... <laughs> so that was this morning. Um, that was this morning. Two of our girls slept in a tent last night, and uh, I told them I'd get them up this morning. And you see Kayla's crutches, so she was one of them. <laughs> it's just a funny story. Uh when I went in there, there was only one sleeping bag, and I knew there were two girls in there. And so when I pulled it back, there were two girls in one sleeping bag. <laughs> I just thought that that was awesome. So I love being a dad. Uh, I've got I got some of the coolest kids. Your kids are cool too. Um, I just I really enjoy being a dad. And so we just want to say thank you. So we got some two two very cool gifts that we're going to do. So Lena's got these names over here, and so we're going to draw these out. And uh, we've got uh, some uh, Lowe's gift cards. So the first up is a seventy-five dollar Lowe's gift card. And so, uh, so she took care of that. So good deal. <laughs> so we're just gonna we're just gonna pick this out here, and Jamie Williams. <laughs> Where'd he go? All right, he's here somewhere because I say I think I, he's helping with Carly. So we'll get this to Jamie. So I'll set that down there. What's funny is, is that Courtney uh, got that for Mother's Day. So I thought that was so neat. Justin Addington, you're the grand prize winner of a $100 gift card to Lowe's. So let's throw that in there. Thanks, buddy. Happy Father's Day, man. Uh, I like stuff from Lowe's, too. <laughs> I don't think I've ever won anything. <laughs> First time winner. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's a big deal, and uh, so I said it's a great day, and, and as you can see, you know, we can have fun from the stage, and, uh, and I, like, I like donuts, and uh, if those would have been hot, fresh now, I mean, I would have destroyed Kegley, um, I would have destroyed him, uh, but, you know, dads are important, moms are important, aunts, uncles, um, grandparents, you all are, are so important, and uh, we have great responsibilities uh, to the younger generation, to the generation coming up. We have such a responsibility to the generation that we're living in right now. 
and we have so many different influences. And so when you think of Father's Day, what do you think of? You know, some of us will immediately will go to start thinking about our father. And some of you, you know, you have fathers that, that have passed. Uh, and so it's the time just you can really honor and reflect that, man, God, thank you so much for the time in which, which that I had. Uh, as of you, you're just thinking about your fatherhood role. Or maybe we've got some, uh, some mothers that are fulfilling both roles. Uh, you're, you're the mom and the dad, you know, in, in your home. And so you, it's a great responsibility. So when you think of Father's Day, you know, what is it that you, that you think of? thing about it is is that uh, whether you're the father or the mother uh, being the guide being the light uh, is is not always easy there's going to be times as Amanda already said that you you can't fix something and sometimes you know my kids are bringing up something to me a toy or something and it's in you know it's in pieces and they've got this idea that daddy can fix it I'm like guys this is this is beyond this is beyond fix and there's a few times that I put things back together that it was not the way that it was intended, but they were tickled to death because I gave it a good effort, and they had something. Uh, they had something. Uh, they had something. When you think of Father's Day, what do you think of? Just regardless of the relationship you have with your father, regardless of the relationship that you're in right now, whether you're the father or the mother, an aunt or uncle, whether you're a grandparent, what is presented before you right now is an opportunity to do something great. This is going to be a completely different message, unlike any that I've ever shared with you before, but it's really heavy upon my heart. And so we're just going to dive right into this because what I want you to do is to leave here today with a plan for your family to lay up something great for your family. That regardless of your role in your family, whether parent, Mother, Father, what's on my heart is for you to leave today with a plan to lay up something great for your family. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be at several different places. I encourage you to take some notes because uh, we're going to be flip-flopping, and I usually don't do this, uh, but we're going to start off in uh, Psalm 89. And uh, this is David writing, and he says, I will sing of the loving kindness of the Lord forever to all generations. To all generations, I will make known your faithfulness with my mouth. For I have said, loving kindness will be built up forever in the heavens. You will establish your faithfulness. Uh, this is telling us about the Lord's covenant that he made with David and David's covenant with the Lord. David had a very special relationship with the Lord and David really sought him out. He really sought him out. You can read in 1 Samuel um, chapter 13. This is when uh, Samuel goes to anoint David uh, as the new king of Israel. And it says, here's the verse that we hear often re, you know, referred to, that he was a man after God's own heart. That, that comes from that First Samuel chapter 13. So David's relationship with the Lord, it was so intimate. He said, I am going to make you famous. I'm going to make sure that all generations know that your loving kindness never fails. It never fails. David was making a mission to pass this on to generations what is your mission to pass on to generations sometimes we're so consumed with the now that we're not looking ahead of the future what is going to be left beyond us i know that we want to live forever or as long as we possibly can but what's going to be passed on afterwards it's so important specifically he said that he would make his faithfulness known to all generations telling about how great the lord is now this is very important in psalm 89 he says this start with verse 30 so psalm 89 verse 30 he said if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgment so it looks like it's something negative right here if if you're not walking in my judgment if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, and listen to this, I will not lie to David. So this covenant with David is going to be passed on. And he's saying, 
that if they have iniquity, which is sin, if they mess up, I will punish them, but I'm not going to remove my faithfulness from them. It's kind of like if your parents, you know, ever disciplined you, and uh, I heard these words, that this hurts me more than it hurts you. Have y'all heard those words? Uh, yeah. I wish they wouldn't even say it. It, it. it doesn't make it feel any better. But that's what this verse is talking about. Because I love you, I'm going to discipline you. And so we can veer off the path, but he's not going to break off the loving kindness. And so church, what we need to understand is that when one generation, talking about us, is faithful, it is possible for us to store up or lay up the grace of God for future generations. It's possible for us to lay up mercy for the future generations. My covenant I will not break. I love that. My covenant I will not break. Church, he is faithful. He is faithful. And this is why the rainbow was hung in the sky. It's to remind us of the promise. Church, he is faithful. So we don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry about his faithfulness. He is faithful. Now, we've been talking about Solomon. Right now, so far, we've been talking about David and, and the Lord in this special relationship. But then David and Bathsheba had a son. That's who we've been studying about is Solomon. And this is where Solomon comes into the picture. I love this. This is in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I love this. In 1 Chronicles 28, and this is verse 9. This is David speaking to his son Solomon. He says, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. I love this. He is telling his son, know the Lord. Serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And here comes the heart of it. He's telling him, son, above anything else, above the riches, above all the earth, have a relationship with the Lord. And if you, once you get to verse 10, he says, consider now. For the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be courageous and act. David, King David, wanted to build a temple, a church for the Lord. Because at this point, they were using tents, referred to as a tabernacle. It was a mobile church, a mobile sanctuary. David was sitting in his palace and he said, It's not right for me to sit in this grand palace while the Lord is out there in a tent. But the Lord would not let David build a temple so that he had too much blood on his hand from all the wars. But that he was going to give him a son and it was going to be his job to build a temple. David is now giving this charge over to Solomon. He first starts out with the relationship with the Lord. Have a relationship with the Lord. This is the utmost desire that he has for him. Have a relationship with the Lord. He says, now consider this. You've been chosen to build the temple. And we talked about storing up mercy, storing up this treasure. Now, you can keep on reading through this because David wanted to have a part of building this temple. So what he did is that he stored up materials to help Solomon. So if you keep on reading, he gave instructions what the temple should look like and the dimensions. But he also gave him one million talents of silver and a hundred thousand talents of gold. Now, I know that we don't really comprehend what that is. In today's market value, that's around $8.5 billion that the father laid up for the son. Now, we're starting thinking about this, and like, man, what could I do with $8.5 billion? This was his heart, a man after God's own heart, wanted to build a temple so bad that he stored up these treasures to help his son build the temple. Your decisions, our decisions, can greatly impact our future generations. They can impact your children, your children's children, and your neighbor's children. They can impact your nieces and your nephews. Grandparents, you have some of the greatest influences more than anybody else. 
because they respect you. They'll listen to you when they won't listen to their own parents. Their own parents can tell them something, and all they hear is blah, blah, blah. But the grandparents tell them something, like, oh, that's a great idea. It frustrates me to no end. But I'm glad that they're getting some wise counsel through some pretty cool people. (laughs) But we have a great power. We can pass this on to future generations. Now, we're talking about we can lay up treasure, and I know that this example with David has laid up a financial treasure, but church, it goes beyond financial. Beyond financial. Because there's something that goes beyond anything money can purchase. More than anything that money can value. And just as we can store up mercy, just as we can lay up grace for future generations, we can do the same thing with our iniquity or our sin. Job 21, 19, it says this. And church, if you don't leave with anything else, then I want you to leave with this caution. Because your actions do not affect just you. In Job 21, 19, it says, You say God stores away a man's iniquity for his son. Let God repay him so that he may know it. Store up iniquity for his sons. The sons, the sins of the parents can be carried over to the children. So your actions will never affect just you. It affects the people around you. And more, more importantly, it affects the people that you love. Your actions, your lifestyle, your sin. There's nothing done in secret that will not be revealed. This scares me. To know that my actions impact my kids to know that the grandchildren that I don't have yet can be greatly impacted by my choices my life's decisions right now your children your great 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 grandchildren can be impacted by the decisions you make this week in the church that kind of scares me Here's your caution I want you to leave with, is that your actions will never affect just you. Never affect just you. So to think that things we do could affect people around us in a negative way, man, that, that really scares me. Look at this, it's Proverbs 13, 22. This is the words that Solomon had pinned down for us. And he says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I love that. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Now we understand the inheritance part. I've counseled a lot of families through the death of someone. And you wouldn't believe the arguments that they have. Over furniture and, and Bibles and, and clothing and a hammer. That was, my, that was my daddy's hammer. And they're really taking ownership of, of these things. So we understand the inheritance part. But what about the other things that we are inheriting? The lifestyle. The sin. So we are... We need to live our lives in such a way that it really reflects what we really care about. So we need to live our lives in such a way that our children and our grandchildren will look back and go, now that was a patriarch. That was someone who really loved God. This is exactly what Joshua led the children of Israel to do. In Joshua chapter 4, again, this is another example They were crossed over the Red Sea, so they had fled Egypt. The Israelites were up to the Red Sea, and they walked over on dry ground. The Lord split the sea. They walked over on dry ground. When they got to the other side, this is where this picks up. It says, let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off from before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. They chose 12 men, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Had each one of them to pick up a stone and build a memorial by this Red Sea. For future generations, so when they said, hey, what do these stones represent? You're like, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what God did. And church, this is what we need to do in our lives, is live it in such a way 
that when our children and our great-grandchildren, when they look back at family pictures or when they're looking back at something in our lives, an example, they can say, man, would you tell me about how God moved in your life or living in such a way that our kids can see the Lord's work. Our kids need to see that. So I'm not talking about just fathers. I'm talking about everyone around you. We, the last song that we, we played there, My Lighthouse, you are being a light to someone, whether we realize it or not. So what are they going to get from us? Church, is there something in your life, does your life right now being a beacon that your kids will go, huh? Now that's, that's powerful. Are there things in your life Are there examples in your life that indicate that you are a child of God? Are there examples in your life that are being passed on to your kids or all that they see is somebody who cares about work? It's all they care about is possessions. So the lives that we live, and we can store up blessings, We can store up mercy for our children because it does impact us, but it can greatly impact the generations to come. Here's an example of this being passed on, and this is in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is mentoring this young man, Timothy, and I love this. He's talking to Timothy. He says, this is 2 Timothy 1, 5. He says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice. So he's talking to Timothy and he says, Hey, I seen this in your grandmother and in your mother. And now we we'll keep reading. He says, That is in you as well. I am sure that it is in you as well. I am sure it's in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. He said, I see it. I saw it in your grandmother. I saw it in you. And now I see it in you. And I've got the same thing that people are telling me about my relationship with my Heavenly Father and the relationship that my dad has with the Heavenly Father. And they're saying very similar things. They're seeing this in them. It has been recognized. I see it in your grandmother. I see it in you. I saw it in your mother. Church, we can pass on this love for God. And it does not mean that we're going to get it perfect. We are going to mess up. Last Sunday, I shared with you how I messed up on Saturday in church. I did it again yesterday. We're going to mess up as parents. And we're going to fall short of God's glory. But we keep pointing our children. We keep living for God. We can lay up mercy. We can pass on this love of God to our nieces and nephews. We can lay up these relationships. Now let's go back to Solomon. He built the temple. At the dedication service, they offered a great sacrifice. They sacrificed 20,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. In today's market value, those animals will be valued around $40 million that they sacrificed. Now, the sacrifice means they, they were slaughtered and they burnt them up. So if you can imagine having, you know, $40 million and it being somebody lighting a match to it, that's almost the equivalent of it, okay? Just understand that. So it's a great large sum of money. But understand, where did this attitude come from? It came from King David. He set up Solomon, and now Solomon has fallen in the same footsteps. So at the dedication day, this is what he sacrificed. And then Solomon prayed. Solomon prayed. Now I want you to understand, David has been dead 11 years. He's been dead 11 years. And Solomon is still following in the example that his own father, David, set. Now, I love this. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 6. It's at the dedication service. Solomon prays this prayer. I love this. In 2 Chronicles 6, 42, it says this. This is at the part of his prayer. This is his closing. We always end our prayers You know, in Jesus' name, here's how he ended it. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember your loving kindness to your servant David. He'd been in the grave 11 
years and still this reference to David and the relationship that he had with God is being brought out. After he prayed that, that prayer, you can read over in chapter 7, but the glory of the Lord filled that temple. He prayed, remember your loving kindness to your servant David. So church, we can set our kids up for something great, but church, it goes beyond anything financial. It goes beyond possessions to carry on a relationship with the Father that is so vital. Eleven years after David's death, it was so impressed upon Solomon that he included in his closing remarks of his prayer. Now let's go on. David had been dead eleven years. Now, David had been dead 57 years. 57 years. And his grandson, Abinadim, became king. And he did not walk in the ways of the Lord. So there's a new king. He did not walk in the ways of the Lord. This is 1 Kings 15. And it starts at verse 3. And this is talking about his grandson. It says, And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. But for David's sake, it's very important, verse 4, but for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Verse 5, because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except from the case of Uriah the Hittite. David's life is still speaking. For David's sake, 57 years after his death, his life is still speaking. His example is still speaking. Now he's got this one mark, and that was with Bathsheba and what he did with the Hittite. Uriah, Bathsheba's wife. So David's life is still impacting children. David's life is still impacting grandchildren. Now let's look on to 2 Kings chapter 19, because this lifestyle, it continues. David has been dead now 305 years. We can't comprehend that. 305 years later, David's life is still speaking. His, let me get this right. His great, 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 great grandson. That's six greats. So his six great grandson is now king, Hezekiah. He got a letter from the enemy. They are surrounding the city. 185,000 soldiers are ready to come and take over the city. He takes this letter to the temple and he prays. He cries out to the Lord and this is the Lord's response. This is 2 Kings chapter 19. And it starts at verse 32. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there. And he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. Verse 33. By the way that he came, by the same way he will return. He shall not come to this city, declares the Lord. And here's what's important. Verse 34. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Three hundred and five years later, and David's life is still impacting generations. 305 years later. Here is David's walk with God, and it's being passed on, it's being impacted for many years later. And the Lord is still honoring that covenant. He's still honoring that life. And you may be here saying, well, this is great about Solomon and building the temple with eight and a half billion dollars. Yeah, my life would be blessed too if I had eight and a half billion dollars. And I'd love to have so much money that we could donate 40 million dollars to church. That's all good and well, but what about me and my life? What about me and what my family are going through right now? I don't have 40 million dollars lying around. I ain't got an extra 40 dollars. What about God's blessings for me? What am I to do? I'm glad you asked. Because in Isaiah 55, he addresses a covenant with you. Isaiah 55, verse 3, and it says, Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. 
It's not that David and his family are just going to be impacted. We are. And we are directly connected to David. We are directly connected to David. Because David's family tree comes down to two people, Mary and Joseph, both of them in the descendants of King David. Both of them. Jesus, born through Mary, died for us and connects us, those who are saved, directly to David. David's life is still impacting generations and it's impacting us. He has lifestyle. Church, your lifestyle, you have a choice to make whether to honor or dishonor. You can choose to honor your kids, to honor your nieces and nephews, to honor your grandparents, to honor your grandchildren. You have this choice that you can make. But the choice is whose? It's yours. What we have a tendency to do is blame the devil, blame somebody else. Well, it was my ex's fault for the situation I am. Oh, it's my employer's fault for the situation I am. Oh, it's my parents' fault. Church, we can make the decision right now to be the turning point for our family. Maybe you don't like Father's Day or Mother's Day because of what it reflects back, what you reflect on in your life. Maybe you don't like that. You can be the turning point for the generations to come based upon your decision right now, and it's in your choice. Your choice as a father, as a mother, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a grandparent, whatever that is, as a friend, as a neighbor. We had, we had some adults up here with children that wasn't theirs. I love that. I love that. Because we are a light to more than just our own kids. Generations. Generations. Me and your family need you to lead them. They need you to lead them. Lead them where? To the Lord. Bring them to church. Do whatever it takes to get your family to church. Whatever it takes. This is exactly what these three friends of this lame man did. They said, man, if we can just get our friend to Jesus. They carried him on a mat. They couldn't get into the house where Jesus was. So they ran around, climbed up on the roof, and opened the roof up to a stranger's house. How would you feel if Jesus, your guest, was in your house with all these other people, and some strangers... Start taking the roof off of your house while your guest of honor is there just to get him to Jesus. That's how important it was. I don't know about y'all, but I'll be highly upset. I'll be, <laughs> and after it's all said and done, I'll be like, okay, who's fixing this? I would be upset, but their friends were determined to get them to Jesus. Same thing with the woman with the issue of blood. She's been sick for years and years and years. She said, if I can just get to Jesus. If I could just get to Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. That's how determined we are to be, to get our loved ones to Jesus. Just get them here. Church, get them to church. Do whatever it takes to get them to church. And when they say, well, the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites, and all you've got to do is say, we could use one more. Get them here. Do whatever it takes to get them here so they can develop their relationship with the Lord. The Lord will take care of the cleaning up. We just got to get them here. Get them here and get them here. Church, as easy as it is to skimp on church, don't. Make it a priority. Make your kids to see that Sundays are not just a regular day. It's not an extra Saturday. It's Sunday. It's referred to as the Lord's Day. Get them here. Let them see that your relationship with God is so important that even though we're tired, even though there's stuff at home to do, we're going to get them to church. Why? Because that's where we worship our Lord and Savior. Make it a priority. Let your kids see that. Let your grandkids see that. Let them see that. Get them here. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've had a bad week. Get them to church. Maybe you had a fight on your way here. Bring them to church. Come. This is where we worship the Lord. Maybe you had an issue with your kids this week. Great. Bring them. Because we've got some other teachers that are going to speak life into them. And you know what's so powerful? And I've seen it with our preteens. I've seen it with our youth. I've seen it in our kids' church. That they have a way of explaining something to make you not out to be the enemy as a parent. They understand. They're listening to somebody else other than just you. Bring them. Make it that point. Now to tell you how vital this is, I want to share this in closing. There was a study done in the 1700s comparing two families. 
one family, the father, the name of Max Jukes, J-U-K-E-S, Max Jukes. Max Jukes was a liar, a thief, a drunk, and his wife was just as evil as he was. Out of 540 of their descendants, 310 died in poverty, 150 were convicted criminals, 100 were drunkards, and 190 were confirmed female prostitutes. They did not have a relationship with the Lord. They did not come to church. They did not read their Bibles. As you can see, what was passed on to their future generations. In a nearby neighborhood, there was another family. The father, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards married the love of his life, Sarah Edwards. They loved the Lord. They worshipped him. They would often spend evenings horseback riding and talking about their days. He would pray over his children. They had 11. Out of their 1,394 studied descendants, 100 became preachers and missionaries, 60 of them became authors, 80 of them became public officials, 75 military officers, 65 college professors, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, 3 mayors, 3 governors, and one, 3 senators, and 1 American vice president. Church, do not tell me that your actions are only going to impact just you. Now, if I share nothing else with you other than those two families, which one do you want to which one do you want to be a part of? Church on this Father's Day. How do you need to respond? Because when I read those statistics of these two families, that was in the 1700s. Church, it breaks my heart to know that we've got families who are being raised and they have no idea who the Lord is. A lady I know, was she worked at a jewelry store and there was a, a woman that came in with her grandchild. She wanted a cross. And she was helping her pick one out. And she said, honey, which one do you want? And she said, I want the one with the little man on it. The little man. Church, it's so important that we make it a point to get our families to church. You get them to church. You bring them to the Lord. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be bad weeks. But church, your family, your future generation is dependent on it. How do you need to respond to God's word this morning? I know that was a little different. And it was so heavy upon my heart. Because I want you to leave the day determined to get your family to Jesus, whatever it takes. You get them to Jesus. He'll do the cleaning up. I know it ain't perfect. I know your lifestyle is not what you planned. I know that we have an enemy, the devil. And he wants to destroy you. Almost to make you the point to where you don't want to live. Sometimes you even question why. You feel like you're not making any progress. Your family's still struggling. Where's the blessings of the Lord at? It's at His feet. It's at His feet. Church, as we come to a close today, is there something going on in your life, in your family's life, that you need to lay down at His feet? The altar is open. I encourage you to come. Lay your family, lay your burdens down at the Master's feet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. We just pray right now, God, that you do something great. Stir in us, Father, that we may respond to your word and do whatever it takes to get our family to you. 
as you continue to pray, friends, family, the altar is open. You need to get your family to church, and I encourage you to come and lay your family down on this altar. You're not where you need to be with the Lord? Great. Come and lay your family down at this altar. You got burdens going on in your life? Lay them down at this altar. I know things are struggling. I know things are hard. I know things are not easy. Come and lay them down. Come lay them down. Nobody's looking around, and we've got several people here at the altar right now. Church, you need to come and bring your family to the altar this morning. Lay them down. Maybe there's something going on in your heart, and your life, that you really need to. This morning, maybe you've just really been challenged. That your lifestyle will impact more than just you. Is there something on your heart you need to bring to the altar this morning? The altar is open. Nobody's looking around. It's just an opportunity for you to come to the altar. An opportunity for you to come to the altar. To lay it down at the master's feet. Are you where you need to be with the Lord? Are you where you need to be? Maybe you need to come and share that. Bring that. Call out to the Lord. Are you where you need to be? I'm not talking just about your decisions this week. I'm talking about your lifestyle. Does it reflect your relationship with the Lord? I encourage you to come to this altar. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make, we're going to make some big ones. But your family needs to know that you love the Lord and you're going to bring them there. Good week, bad week, it doesn't matter. You're going to get them there. If had a tough weekend, we're going, to, we're going to go to the Lord. So when we think of David, we see of his faithfulness. May we leave here today, have chosen, made the decision that we are going to lead our family to the Lord. Men, I want to lift you up in prayer right now. And if you'll just pray with me. I know we've got some men out front. We've got some uh, upstairs serving as well with their youth right here in the States. Right? All you men, I want to pray for you right now. If you'll just, if you just take a moment and just pray with me right now, all you men. Heavenly Father, I pray your richest blessings upon these men. Father, that you would lead them and guide them and they would seek you. Just as David told Solomon that if we would seek you, we would find you. God, I pray that you'd touch these men that they would seek with all their hearts. Well, I know that as men, sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to have all the right answers, to take care of things. But Father, this morning you're teaching us that we need to seek you. So I pray for these men, Father, that you'd lead and guide them and help them, Father, to lead their families with all that they've got and to do whatever it takes to get their family to church, to get their family to you. Well, I want to lift up all the ladies in here today. We have some very special ladies, and they're fulfilling both roles. And uh, we pray, God, that you would richly bless them. I help them, Father, to lead their families. Father, help them to teach their kids and to show them just how important a relationship with you is and how important, how vital it is that no matter what we experience, that we, we get our kids to church. Father, I lift up these grandparents to you. What a great impact uh, they can have upon uh, their children uh, and their grandchildren. So I pray, Father, for wisdom. Would you bless these grandparents? We love them so much. And help them, Father, to point their families, their children and grandchildren to you. Father, I lift up all these kids to you we have here at our church. Father, their future is bright. And we pray your richest blessings over them. Help them, Father, to see you in us. Father, we thank you for our friends who our kids love so much. They look up to, they often go to for guidance and wisdom when they won't hear it from anywhere else. May you bless them, Father, and help them to point their friends' kids to you. Father, it is Father's Day, and I know that it can bring up mixed emotions and feelings among many people. Regardless of our lifestyle, regardless of our, our part in our families, may we leave here today, Father, having been challenged to live a life that a legacy would go on beyond us. Father, we read three different examples. One when David was 11 years dead, 57 years, and 305 years later, his life was still speaking. 
Father, it's our prayer today as we leave her today that we're going to be a light, not just for our families, but for future generations to come, that we love you, Father. May our family, our friends, our co-workers, may they see this lifestyle. Thank you, God, so much for all that you do and all that you're going to do. May we honor you now with our lips and be the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you take a moment to give God some awesome praise? Amen. Happy